We interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. The reports of a flying saucer hovering over the city have been confirmed. Did you really go out with an alien? Uh-huh. What was it like? Real different. Becoming Human, a Mork and Mindy podcast. Hello listeners, this is Paula Schaffner with a look back at Season 3 of Mork and Mindy. In some ways, Season 3 was an attempted return to Season 1, as indicated by the title of the season opener, Putting the Orc Back at Mork. But in looking at it again, it's more that they pulled back on some of the wilder elements of Season 2, and they made Fred into more of a regular, although he's not in every episode. They kept the three additional cast members from Season 2, Remo and Jeannie da Vinci, and Mindy's cousin Nelson Flavor, but they definitely scaled back on their appearances, and then they added the new character of Glenda Fay Com stock. They still brought in Exidor and Mr. Bickley, and they had the regular daycare kids. Season 3 compared to Season 2 feels less of a whiplash. It feels more consistent in tone and style. Probably the most significant change for Season 3 was that Mindy got a job in a television station. In the first season, the regular hangout spot other than Mark and Mindy's apartment was the music store. Then in Season 2, it was the deli, which they never really did anything that I liked with. And then in season three, we have Da Vinci's restaurant, but that's not used very much. And so the TV station becomes more of that home away from home, but certainly not to the extent of the music store or even the deli. In season two, Morgan Mindy had dropped out of the top three and landed at number 27 in the ratings. In season three, it didn't even make the top 30. It may have been that season two turned people off, or maybe the formula felt rather stale. For me, the quality of the show was actually surprisingly strong. And I think one thing is that compared to season two, there's not as many lows. I use a rating system of zero to four eggs, which which measures how well each episode delivers what I'm looking for in the series. And the lowest this season went was one and a half for the Rick and Ruby episode and one and three quarters for the Peter Pan episode. Looking at the averages, season one was 2.76 eggs and season two was 2.5. So not a dramatic drop, but certainly a drop. And this one actually ended up being 2.72. Overall, the season was almost as good as season one but certainly helped by some of its stronger episodes. When I did the top five for season one, there were six episodes that I gave three and a half eggs. So it was just a matter of narrowing it down to the top five, plus an honorable mention. For season two, I had one episode that I gave a three and a half, and then there were two that I gave three and a quarter, and then one that I gave a 3.14, so then I had to narrow down to my favorite of the threes. This time around, I again gave out one three and a half and two three and a quarters, and then there were five that I gave three eggs. Narrowing it down was trickier this time around. In chronological order, my honorable mentions are episode 54, Gunfight at the Morquet Corral, which was the episode where Corey Feldman had a larger role to play. This episode was better than I remembered, and it was the first episode where I felt that the season was starting to find itself because it did have a bit of a bumpy start with that Peter Pan episode and then the one with Mork playing pranks, which in retrospect kind of feels like the season two thing of Mork being me spirited or at least insensitive towards Mindy and I felt like that was less of a problem overall in season three than it was in season two although we didn't get back that often to the sweet innocent side of Mork. There are definitely times when he is clueless in season three but there's not that charm that exists in season one and you can't put that lightly back in the bottle along with the freshness of the show and I will say that some of the lessons that Mork learns and things he learns about in season three were things that should have been covered earlier and that was something that came up in season two but definitely more so this season. Keeping that freshness is hard. 
another episode that I gave three eggs to was Mindy Gets Her Job, which was really pivotal, obviously, with that new setting of her working at the local TV station. And we are introduced to the Mr. Sternhagen and Jake Loomis characters who will reappear in some of the TV station episodes. And it gives Mindy more of a focus. In my season one review, I talked about how we didn't really know much about Mindy apart from work. We saw her interact with her family and we saw a little bit of her romantic and social life. But other than her going back to college, there wasn't too much of that side of her. And then in season two, they ended up not doing enough with her going back to school, although it did feature a bit in some of the episodes with her wanting to write exposés or there'd be a throwaway line or something. But in season three, we do get actual episodes showing her working. And it was good to have that side of her. That will take a different turn in season four, but it will continue. Mindy Gets Her Job is just a fun but flawed episode. I most enjoyed the stuff at the TV station, actually, but the other stuff not as much. But it was just an episode where I was really happy for Mindy after all she'd gone through that she does get her job. Another honorable mention goes to the episode called Mindy, Mindy, Mindy. So obviously that gave Pam Dauber more to do. In fact, she gets to play three different aspects of Mindy because Mork really misses her while she's gone. So the elder who had appeared on the season opener comes along and he's able to clone Mindy. And so then Mork is reacting to the clones. I feel like the episode could have been stronger, but it's still a lot of fun. It was good to see the elder come back. My fifth favorite episode of the season, Old Muggable Mork, which was episode number 66. I will admit some of this has to do with my fondness for Cora and how happy I was that she returned, but I really did like what she did in this episode and just seeing her interact with her family again was really great. I appreciated Elizabeth Kerr and it was a reminder of how the series had missed her those two years. I still would have chosen a different plot for her than the mugging, but it did work out better than I expected. It's both a happy and a sad episode, and I did like how the family supports her. It is an episode with not that memorable guest stars otherwise, uh, although we do get Scott Marshall, son of Gary, providing an interesting take on a Boy Scout. This is another episode where Mork is in drag, and one thing that came up in my season two review is that there was more gender bending going on in season two than season one and that definitely continued into this season and some of this will become ironic especially the references to male pregnancy. The other episode for this season that I gave a three is one that even at the time I felt like well maybe I underrated it. It's Mork Meets Robin Williams which is obviously one of the most famous episodes of the series and it continues that theme of celebrities and heroes and fame and there was a bit of this in the Morke Corral episode as well. The episode offers us glimpses of not only the real Robin Williams but I think between the lines the real Pam Dauber so there's that extra layer to it. It's another episode that involves Mindy's new TV career because she's trying to get an interview with Robin Williams. The scene with Mork, Mindy, and Robin Williams is really powerful powerful. Robin does a good job of making these two very different characters, his real self and Mork Pam interacting with them. And the tag is also really strong and obviously hits even harder now. And you can hear the emotion in Robin Williams' voice as he lists off all these celebrities who died. But the rest of the episode, including the stuff at the restaurant and I have to admit the TV station, was just not as strong. So that's why I gave it a three. I also rate each of these episodes on a zero to four heart scale, which measures how well it supports and promotes the romantic relationship of Mork and Mindy. I kept thinking that this was not a shippy season because there definitely were some episodes that were not terribly shippy, including Old Muggable Mork and Mork Meets Robin Williams. Season one averaged out to one and a quarter. It was just really low, and admittedly that included some Happy Days episodes that didn't really have Mindy. A lot of season one was just Mork meeting all kinds of people and just becoming friends with Mindy. There definitely were some romantic moments and some very sweet ones at that, but it wasn't a terribly shippy season. And then season two averaged out to one and a half, so that was an increase. 
I thought that this was going to be below that, but in the end, helped quite a bit by some episodes in particular, this averaged out to 1.56 hearts. The reason why I mention this now is because three of those episodes that were shippy are also my three favorite episodes of the season, and those are not unrelated. An episode doesn't have to be shippy to be good, but it did help in these cases. At number three, there's Midian Work, which as its title suggests, is about gender roles. It's also about communication and empathy. It's definitely about Mork and Mindy's relationship. And then it relates to the impact of Mindy's new career and them trying to find a new balance. I was dubious about the concept because I thought it was just gonna be this switching roles kind of thing of you'll do the housework and I'll do this, but it actually won me over and I liked where it went. I liked how Mr. Bick and Exodor were used to explore the concepts of sexism and how that influences Mork and it's also one of the episodes of the series that addresses the influence of the media, in this case specifically sitcoms. Mork has to think beyond that and he doesn't have to be Ozzy or Harriet. Of course, the ironic casting of Eleanor Donahue, whose father knew best. She does a very nice cameo in this role of a middle-aged working woman who is a sympathetic character, both likable and someone who sympathizes. And I found the episode funny and sweet and thought-provoking. In some ways, it sets up some of the motifs of season four. I gave it two and a half hearts because it was about Mark and Mindy's relationship and it ends with them expressing how happy they are together, particularly how happy he is. And there had been the episode earlier in the season, Mork the Swinging Single, where he kind of experimented with being single and found that he prefers Mindy. The other three and a quarter episode is episode 60, which was There's a New Mork in Town. This has one of the best guest stars in the series, Lyle Wagner, who is typecast, but kind of playing against it and just having a lot of fun with the role. He plays plays Mork's hero Zerko and so again the thing of fame and heroes and also in some ways addressing gender roles in a different way because he has toxic masculinity and Mork feels he can't live up to this but Mindy is not attracted to this type. One of the things bringing the episode down is I would have liked Mindy to speak up for herself more. Nonetheless it is a very shippy episode and I talked about this on that pod that when an outsider comes in from from another planet, Mork and Mindy tend to get shippier, and that certainly happens here, where Zerko wants to replace Mork, including as Mindy's roommate. It's a very funny episode, and it's one of those that is just basically about Mork, Mindy, and another person, but Fred and Bickley are used well in their scenes. It's a very home-centered episode, just taking place in the living room and attic. And my other main criticisms were that the holotacker could have been better, and I wanted more about Mindy's job, although because of where this comes in the lineup, that didn't end up being as big a problem because we did get more about Mindy's job later in the season. My favorite episode of the season, and in some ways of the series, is Reflections and Regrets, which was the season closer, and it would have made a fine farewell for all of the characters. I didn't comment on this on that pod, but I just have to give a special shout out to Comrade Janice, who does very well with a dramatic monologue. We've seen how he can bring out the more serious side of Fred, and here he is looking back on a wartime memory of when he was a very young man. Just in his words, he paints this picture, and it's done really well. I could see it on MASH, <laughs> because it is about the Korean War. He will be back, and Tom Poston will be back. The premise for this episode is that they are all sharing their regrets at Mr. Bickley's 50th birthday, and it's a nice episode for Tom Poston. He has more comedic things to do in the episode, but there's an undercurrent of him feeling like he wasted his life. He didn't get to do all he wanted to do. I, in general, enjoyed seeing him this season. It wasn't a big Mr. Bickley season, but it was always good when he'd pop up. It's also not the last episode for Chrissy Wilzak, who played Glenda, and she is the most annoying regular character on this series. So that was a problem for me with season three. But I will say that in this episode, they used her better. They gave her some more serious things to do. She gets a nice dance number with Robin Williams and even her bubbliness is okay. She didn't make me cringe to the 
the extent that she did in some of the other episodes of season three. And it was the last episode for Jay Thomas and Gina Hacked as the Da Vinci siblings. They definitely were in season three much, much less. They didn't really know what to do with them most of the time in season two. And season three, the main episode that they had something to do was one of the worst episodes, the Rick and Ruby episode, which took place at the Da Vinci's restaurant much of the time. Remo didn't even get material like he did in Jeannie Loves Mork. He was just basically the macho kind of dumb guy this season, sometimes sexist. So that was kind of a step back for him. And even in this episode, his regret is just completely a joke, a short comedy routine. Gina Hecht gets to recall something that makes her character more gray, I would say. In fact, she's wearing gray, probably symbolic, because we find out that she had an affair with a married man. But overall, this season, I didn't feel like I got to know her much better. They had a thing where she and Glenda had a partly off-screen friendship but it felt like it was just something there to help them go off stage. So I didn't really feel like we got much out of the Da Vinci's this season. It's a shame. I feel like they did have more potential, maybe with stronger writing, but they are gone from the series after this. It's the last of Jim Stahl as Nelson Flavor. He is pretty much rudderless without the campaign. Season two, several of the episodes were about, or at least referring to him running for city council. Then in the season opener, we find out he lost and he's no longer wearing glasses for some reason. And he's kind of rethinking his life, but they don't really know what to do with him other than he's vaguely dating Glenda. That's a shame too. I feel like maybe Jim Stahl had more potential. In this episode, his regret is both wistful and funny because of how Mork interacts with him. The episode also has what is possibly the last appearance of Amy Tenowich and Stephanie Cayano as Lola and Stephanie from the daycare. I believe it's their last speaking lines in case. The daycare kids were used fairly well this season. It wasn't amazing. I still think that Eugene was a more interesting character, had a bit more depth to him. They pretty much just gave each daycare kid a trait or two, like Stephanie likes to eat and Lola is an intellectual. We saw a little bit of some other daycare kids as well, but they were cute. They weren't obnoxious child actors. It was fun to see them. It's a nice last appearance for them. And the episode also has Exidor with some very surprising regrets that involve his love life. And the Robert Donner stuff was pretty funny. Sometimes the Exidor stuff in season two and three can feel a little bit stale, but I did like it in that episode. Considering it's just a bunch of people sitting around talking, it is a very fluid and active and interesting episode. But what, of course, puts it over the top for me and makes makes me give it three and a half eggs and three and a half hearts, is what happens with Mork and Mindy. I talked about this quite a bit on the pod very recently, so I won't go into detail, but the whole episode leads up to her making a confession that she wishes her mother had lived to meet Mork, who is her best friend and also an alien. And then he reveals that he loves her and she realizes that she loves him. The love between them has been there for a long time, but in some ways unspoken. In Mork's mixed emotions, Mork is able to pull his emotions together and say that they all care very deeply about her. This episode, he says he loves her. So that's the progress we've had in the past couple years. It's just a really strong, moving, funny, fun, sweet episode. And it could have all ended there, but it didn't. I will be going into season four starting in October, and my hope is to line up the pods in roughly 43rd anniversary order, but we'll see how that goes. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening and sharing this series, which means a lot to me, flaws and all. Nanu, nanu. <gasps> Grandma, are you all right? Oh, I, I, I guess so, but I never was so frightened in all my life. Oh, here, sit down. Look at my new hat. Oh, what happened? Oh, children, it, it was dreadful. Well, I was just walking through the park on my way home, and I... and I... I was mugged. Oh, that's awful. 
Don't worry, Graham. You're home now. My dinner flew away. You mind if I have some of your star munchies? Sure, why not? <laughs> I was hoping you'd go for the trail mix. I can't believe this man's actually grazing in front of me. <laughs> well, back to you. I'm sorry to avoid you. I, I, I don't know why I can't say no. I, I guess I want people to like me. I hate myself for that. But I used to be able to say no. What do you mean? Well, before all this craziness started, I, my friends used to call up and go, Robin, come on, we're all going outside. So really, there's some gnarly waves. We can all hang out and I'd have to go, no, my mama said I have to stay inside and read Nietzsche tonight. <laughs> Later on, I guess I felt I was really afraid to, to say no to them because of that. Then they all say like, oh, Robin Williams. Mr. Smarty Pants Big Shot. Wow. You forgot your old friend. You can't lend me $10,000 for a new car. You won't do the Save the Shrimp benefit. This is none of my business, but it, it seems like if they're really your friends, they'd understand. But it seems to me you can't say no to a total stranger. All right. It also looks like you're probably taken advantage of a lot. You know, if you learn to say no, you'd probably have a lot more time to yourself. Uh, maybe that's the last thing I want. Ring, ring. <laughs> Hello. It's Mr. Sternhagen, my boss. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Sternhagen. <laughs> yes, I'm still here. <laughs> yes. No, I, I have a little jeep problem. <laughs> You're right. That's no, no reason to lose my job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Mr. Sternhagen. <gasps> oh, oh, goodness. Well, I have to be at the station in ten minutes, or I'm off the air forever. Oh, here. You just have to fix yourself breakfast, and I'll be home before midnight. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 men. Wait a minute, Mark. Wait. Don't leave, Don't leave without giving me a big... Kiss. I've been ignoring you, haven't I? Well, who can blame you? I mean, I didn't realize I was that hard to live with. As a roommate, I'm no John Ritter. <laughs> terrific. Different, but terrific. Oh, um, Mark, our, our lives are changing, and we just have to do a better job of changing with them. Men, oh. meet Zerko. <laughs> See him, feel him, touch him. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, hello. <laughs> hello, Mindy. This is indeed a pleasure. I've heard so much about you through uh, Mork's reports to Orson. And I must say, you're even more lovely. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Isn't he wonderful, men? Isn't he everything you've ever dreamed of, especially compared to warm sweat like me? Oh. <laughs> well, welcome to Earth, or uh, Nanu Nanu, or whatever I was supposed to say. Say what you feel. <laughs> Are you sure you're an organ? <laughs> you know, if it wasn't for Mindy taking in strays, I would never have a place to be. I just want to thank you for bringing you into this world. Do I love her? Well, I want to, I want to give her everything I have and spend the rest of my life with her. Is that love? Oh. You know, it's, it's kind of funny that I had to come millions of miles to find something deep inside of me. I wonder if she feels the same way. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. I should ask her myself. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, thank you very much. I, I like you, too. That's what I would have said to your mom. I had a feeling you're trying to say something to me, too. Mark, is my mother really here? She told me to give you something. I love you, Mindy. I love you, too, Mark.
magic number. Yeah, it is. It's the magic number. Somewhere in that ancient mystic trinity, you get three. It's the magic number. In the past, in the present, in the future. Faith and hope and charity. In the heart, in the brain, in the body. Yeah.